It's a pleasure. You know, um, these uh, the legislature has perfected a number of the things that we propose, which is the way it ought to be. And you know, we let me just tell you how it works. I mean, these guys come in, uh, we sit around, and we just talk about stuff. And there are no secrets. I mean, if there's a challenge. Talk, you know, these guys will say, where's the language? <laughs> and I look at my people, I say, how many times are they going to ask us for the language? When are we going to get the language? You know, Batchelder reads every bill four times. <laughs> then he goes, I still got to consult 15 constitutional lawyers. And Tom and I are just like, oh, no. But, it's, it, but, it, it, but you know, it gets done. And, and Tom, you know, Tom's prevailed upon me. on enough. These are just great guys. And that's it, that relationship. You know, I've told him we've got a magic moment. This has been magic for, for five, six months when you think about everything that's happened. But I'll tell you why it is, because it's give and take. You know, it's, it's give and take with all of us. And it's a willingness to understand each other's concerns. But these guys, I think they have the hardest job of all. I mean, being the Speaker of the House or being the President of the Senate, I mean, I wouldn't take those jobs. I mean, it, it just grinds you to the ground because you have to use the power of persuasion to be able to get your members to do the right thing, and you don't have much leverage. And, um, you know, they, they've just been fantastic. And, you know, what can you say? I just hope this relationship will continue. I don't want to step on what we're doing here, but we've got a big, exciting agenda to go forward. And for my folks, there was, there was a sense, uh, not even a sense of euphoria when the House finally passed the bill. Uh, it was sort of like, uh, okay, we've won this game, now we've got to go on, you know, we've got to go to the second round of the playoffs. And I think that's really kind of the feeling of all the Republicans. And last night, you all missed being at the rockin' uh, fiscal what is, New Year's party, whatever the hell it was we had over there. And there were so many young people. Uh, in fact, I'm going to get, try to get a meeting with those, these young people. Uh, they're so excited. And, you know, they believe, again, that things can be done the right way. That's what happened here. Strip the politics out, put the people first, forget all the politics, work together. And I, I have to tell you, I'm reminded, one of the seminal moments is when, when Bonnie Cantor came into my office and she was sitting there running aging, and she said, you know, John, I have to give up $700 million in Medicaid funding. Because if I don't move it out of my department and put it in the Office of Health Transformation, it won't work very well. You don't hear that in American politics today. So hopefully Ohio will be an example and a shining light and a role model for the rest of the country. Questions? Governor, the idea of privatization, what's, the, uh, what's your main theory behind it? Is it because that perhaps uh, some of the notions perhaps state workers don't work as hard as private sector is because of the wages in the private sector are lower? Is it because they're shedding the pension costs? No, the no. The reason why you do privatization, it's a reason why you sell assets in the private sector. If you have an underutilized asset, you want to make it work for you. So, for example, uh, the liquor business, you know, uh, one-third of it is used for economic development and two-thirds of it is used to run the government. So the ability to take the liquor business and put it into Jobs Ohio and give them the powder they need to be effective, and believe me, there are other states now that are going to be trying to scramble to figure out how can they do this, is the reason. Let's talk about the turnpike for a second. There's a lot of emotion around the turnpike. I promised uh, the speaker... Uh, you know, this was an issue where we had to kind of come together that I wouldn't uh, try to push anything through. Somebody advised me, veto the turnpike language. Just veto it, take it out of there, and just do what you want. I said, I can't do that. Because you've got to bring people along on these things. Sometimes you've got to just do it. But in this case, you've got to bring them along. But if the turnpike is an underutilized asset, in my opinion, in this state, we can take that and we can privatize it and we can get a big chunk of money that can be used to improve our infrastructure in the state. Indiana did it. Indiana's made a lot of progress. Jerry Ray desperately needs resources in light of the infrastructure needs. So if you can take an underutilized asset and move it, you know, and lease it, first of all, I wouldn't sell it, but lease it and move it into the private sector and, and have great gains from it, that's what you do. This has nothing to do with unions or pensions or it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with getting the best out of what you have. I'll give you another one, Ornet, which is this incredible network of fiber that no one in this room even knows what it is, except for a handful of us. It offers great potential. 
we think about the possibility of subleasing it because it gives businesses the opportunity to do great B2B job training. I mean, unbelievable potential, but it's sat dormant. So that's the philosophy. If it will work better in the private sector, you do it. But everything shouldn't be privatized. But we're going to look at everything as to how to bring better, better improvement. If, if I can piggyback on that, Tom, I, I, I would add that that these are assets that are owned by the taxpayers of the state of Ohio, and and we have an obligation to make sure that those assets <coughs> are performing. And and so privatization is one way to do that. Look at that opportunity and, and make sure the taxpayers are getting what they paid for. But at the same time, you are shedding labor costs. You are shedding pension costs as well. Not necessarily. It depends on how the privatization process works. You at least owe the taxpayers a responsibility to look at it and decide if this is something that makes sense. And I think that's what the governor has outlined in his proposal. Governor, yeah, let me give you an example. Let's take Gary Moore. The taxpayers of this state are paying uh, a lot of money for corrections. If we, can, if we can sell some of these prisons and we can reduce our costs, because the you know these some of these private operations have are safer, <laughs> and they and and they cost less. Why wouldn't we do that for the taxpayer? So, but it isn't about an, you know an assault on somebody. We haven't assaulted anybody in this state. This is all a hyperbole. You call the wrong people. This is about making things work in Ohio and not being a god darn 1920 state that has fallen behind and has been crushed economically. We are getting crushed in this state. We lost two congressmen, there's only one other state, and that's the state of the wackadoodles out in California who've lost two congressmen. Our cities are being hollowed out. I look at the great city of Cleveland, the great city of Cincinnati, and see a loss of 50% of our population, but now we're starting to see good signs. Genova, the cloud computing company that by all rights should be out in Silicon Valley, is up in New Albany. And we're delivering them trained workers, Dan and Yogurt. You think about Dan and Yogurt as something you eat, you go down to Dan and Yogurt, you will find young, highly educated engineers working in Dan and Yogurt. Jim Zeringer was with me. It was one of the great visits. It's exciting. Kids are coming from all over the country to work in that. Uh, we, we, we have, um, down in Butler County, we just announced this, uh, this uh, stepped up, uh, uh, what, what do you call the thing? Shock absorber that there's yeah. in the in the advanced Mercedes Benz. Instead of Tiss and Krupp going to Mexico, they're staying here. They need engineers, Diebold. They need software and hardware engineers. When I was at Dan and Yogurt, I called Gordon Gee. I said, "We need four engineers." He goes, "I'll give them to you." This is the kind of stuff that has to be done in this state to make this state cool, effective, efficient, and job friendly. And we're going to do it. We are doing it. <laughs>